All right. So God's love. And um, that's just the, the brief title. Really, it's how to incorporate God and his love into your life. The reason this really hits home with me um, is because I see so many people struggling to incorporate God's love into their personal lives. And so what that does is it creates um, a bed of instability. And out of that instability, we, um, we make a lot of mistakes. And so I think it's very important that we approach our relationship with God first and foremost, so that all the other relationships in our life can grow from that. Okay, that's the foundation. The relationship you have with God will be the foundation on which you're able to launch relationships with with other people. Okay, so let's get started. So let's start with the foundation of what you are. Okay, what you are. Everybody watching this right now, you are eternal beings. Okay, in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse eleven. Uh, by the way, all the verses tonight are English Standard Version. So if you're curious, uh, but He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I'm not so much focused on the back end of that verse as much as I'm focused on the fact that eternity is in everyone's hearts. Okay. So if you find yourself at times thinking about what happens after you die, that's totally natural. Um, as a matter of fact, Ecclesiastes, that whole book is penned um, by what we believe is King Solomon. It's a really good chance it's King Solomon. But uh, by King Solomon's just understanding and of the reality that we are mortal, but there's something more to us. We're mortal in the sense that we will die in this life. But there's something more to us. There's an eternity that's in our hearts and our minds. And so he was pointing to that idea when he was obviously pinning this part of Ecclesiastes. Now, why this matters. OK, so in Matthew chapter six, 19 through 21. And, and this is uh, this is Jesus speaking. Do not lay up treasures or excuse me. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, and so Jesus is giving us this direction of, look, you are eternal beings. Why are you so focused on the things of this life? They won't lead to any kind of feeling of gratification. Ultimately, they'll feel a le you'll feel emptiness in those things because they will never fully gratify you. And so this is all meant to just point us back towards what really will gratify us, which is ultimately a relationship with God. Now, when what I really enjoy about this, this part of Matthew is that Jesus lays into here for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's, he's discussing the idea that the priorities you have in life, these things will ultimately show the world, yourself, God, who, who you are or who you wish to be. So your treasures will be a reflection of that person. And uh, I really enjoy this C.S. Lewis quote, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in, aim at earth and you will get neither. So again, this is just echoing the sentiment that we are, are eternal beings, and so we should seek for eternal um, goals. All right. What does that look like, right? What, is the, what do those eternal goals look like for us? Well, Jesus gives it, right? Jesus gives us the compass to eternity right here within Matthew uh, chapter 22, 37 through 40. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Okay, so here Jesus is clearly outlining what his hope is, his commandments from God are for us in this lifetime. And he takes it and he summarizes the law and the prophets, which for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the Old Testament. So what he's pulling back, what he's pulling us back to here is he's saying, look, you guys need to pay attention. All right. These are essentially the summary of all of the commandments of the law and the prophet housed within these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. In this commandment, you will find eternal gratification. Okay? So on this Valentine's Day, if you find yourself feeling 
empty or purposeless, or you find that the love in your life is shallow or hollow, this is probably a good reason why, is chances are you're not aligning yourself with this commandment, okay? Now, what I find myself doing with this verse and oftentimes with the conversation of love, especially in today's modern society, is I find myself asking the question of, well, what's the deal with love, right? It seems like the definition of love has been so construed that it almost is uh, like a pass. A, a, you're giving someone a permissible pass to do whatever they want, which on the contrary, that's that's not at all the case here, okay? So 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, I, I underline the sections of this verse I want us to focus on tonight, which is it does not insist on its own way. Okay. A lot of times, right, and I, I put this kind of summary down beneath it, love someone enough to want, want what is always in their best interest, but don't confuse love with a selfish want, which is yours, to force their decisions. Even God lets us rebel. This is a this is a very vital, okay? And, he, and here's why. We can get so caught up in our want to love someone, to serve someone, that we become selfish in our desires for them. Meaning we don't care if it wrongly impacts them or if it ruins the relationship, or at least we, we're not consciously thinking about this. We, we just want what's best for them. But sometimes what that can do is alienate people away from us because we insist on it being our way because we know what's in the best interest for them. So we, we have to walk this line of, yes, I want what's best for you, but I'm not going to try to override your will. Again, that's why I point out, even God lets us rebel. No one can argue that they love each other more or love someone more than God loves us. Okay. No, no one can be God in that. He wins that game all day. But he gives us the example by saying, look, I know what's in your best interest. I know what is, is going to be the best thing to happen for you in your life. But I'm not going to come into your life and override your will. I'll let you make the wrong decisions. Okay. Which that's a whole nother message of why God's allowing those consequences to happen. But I'm just, I'm just going to leave it there. Okay. That, that's a rabbit hole. I don't want to go down it. But <laughs> just leave it, just leave it there. So don't let your selfish desire to um, love someone override tr what true love for that person is. Again, it doesn't insist on its own way. It says, look, this is in your best interest. But if you want to go down this wrong path, I will respect that. And I will still be here for you. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, when a brother sins and how to approach that and et cetera, et cetera. Now, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. The reason I want to bring this up is because in today's society, this, plur this pluralistic approach that society takes is love is, is condoning of, of basically everything in someone's life. That, that's completely incorrect, okay? Parents especially, right? You, you know what's in the interest of your, your child's, uh, or excuse me, you know what's in the best interest of your child's well-being. And so essentially what I'm referring to in this verse is there is an objective reality of what's actually in the best interest of the person you're working with, and you want to help them get to that. So you're not helping anybody by entertaining their fake reality where they're like, if you love me, then you'll, um, you'll let me do whatever I want. You know, if you love me, you'll let me be addicted to meth. Absolutely not. Right. That, that, that's clearly not, um, the truth, it's, it's not, it's, it's a wrongdoing. And, and that's a different message why that would be wrong. But, um, and I think that that deserves its time, but ultimately it's this, is that you want to ensure that you love someone in a way that is harmonious with truth, that is harmonious with the objective reality, that is harmonious with what God has given us um, and, and go from there. All right. So now that we've defined love, okay. How do I practice God's love for myself and others? Notice I use the word practice because it will be a daily task. All right. Now, something that um, I came across, obviously, in, in a Bible study a while back, which, which really hit home with me, is in the Lord's Prayer, there's one section where we are 
we're, we're, when Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer, there's one section where we're directed to do something, okay? So in Matthew chapter 6, uh, uh, verses, your will be done on earth as it is in state. Give us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Or some will say trespassers or sins. And lead us not and deliver us from evil. Now, you guys also have forgiven our debtors. Now, you'll notice in the daily prayer, okay, this, and you know it's a daily prayer, obviously, because of all the daily languages in it, specifically daily bread. Forgive us as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, love is hands down the most important component. Um, if you don't believe me, just go read First and Second Corinthians. Paul talks a lot about love in, in those epistles. But what is essential to us having a God-like, a Christ-like love is the ability to forgive. And this is outlined in the Lord's Prayer because he's saying, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So that is the only part in the Lord's Prayer where we're actually doing something, okay? Apart from glorifying God and asking God to do things for us, of course, requesting his blessing in our lives, we are then coming into the conversation and saying, forgive us as we forgive others, all right? So that is the one part in the Lord's Prayer where we are actually having a task to do. And this is a part of love. Let's say this is an essential pillar of love. And so I want to leave you with these questions um, for, for this aspect of forgiveness, which is if God forgave you like you forgive, what would that look like? Do you think that is acceptable? Why or why not? And I really employ you to look deeply into how are you forgiving other people? How are you forgiving yourself? And then Understand that the criteria that you are applying in both of those scenarios is the criteria that you are now going into the Lord's Prayer and asking God to use with you. And if you don't like that criteria, there's a, probably a really good chance you should change the criteria that you're using. Okay? So use the criteria for forgiveness that you want God to use with you. Now, um, what do we do when people who we love come in and like they sin against us, right? Because obviously you want to love people and have that level of forgiveness, but there is a level of correctiveness um, that needs to be there. And this is outlined within Luke. So Luke chapter 17, verses three through four. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if, if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him, excuse me. Then you are to forgive him. Okay. Rebuke him is essentially saying, give him corrective behavior. Tell him in what way or her in what way have they committed a transgression, a sin of some nature, inform them, give them the information to act on it. And from there, if they ask for repentance, you are to give it. And if they keep doing it, there's the, uh, there was that old saying, right? It's like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, we're, we're trying to let someone fool us uh, 70 times seven, right? We, we want to allow that, that level of forgiveness provided they're coming back and repenting from that sin. Now, if they're not, now you can understand that this person is committing sin and they're not repentive of that sin. That's a different situation than if they're coming to you and being repentive of that sin. Now, that does not mean you should harbor hate for the person. It just means be wary of them. And the example I like to give is this. I can love a snake from 30 feet away. You see what I'm saying? I don't have to, oh, I love this snake or I love this lion and I care for their well-being and now I want to go up and stick my hand where I know it's going to get bit. No, I, when you understand when a person's operating in a dangerous mindset, sometimes it's a good thing to do is give yourselves the needed distance to respect them and love them from a distance until they realize the folly of their ways. And sometimes you've got to be the one providing that criticism but do it in a way that's loving. Okay. Keys to forgiveness. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you guys 10 keys to forgive, 10 keys to walk with. Number one, let go of the anger. Anybody here who's a Star Wars fans or Star Wars fan knows that anger 
is the power of the Sith, right? And it's holding on to that anger. But then you always see these Jedi come in and the Jedi are like, you got to let go of that anger. It's going to consume you. It's the road to destruction. It is. It's, it is the road to destruction. When you let go of that anger, that is the first step necessary for you to begin the, the road to healing, the road to forgiveness. Well, you have to forgive and then to heal. So, but if you, if you don't let go of the anger, then whatever forgiveness you're offering this person is basically a waste of both of your times. Don't be stubborn. Don't, don't give th this person some ridiculous arbitrary standard that they need to meet for you to forgive them. Like, well, I'll forgive you if you make dinner for me for a week. It's like, no, like, <laughs> don't be stubborn. Don't try to like keep your way about things. If they come and ask for forgiveness, readily give it to them. Stop thinking of yourself as a victim. I feel like I could make a whole sermon on that right there. I could preach on just that part right there. I mean, society needs to hear this. People, we all need to hear this. We get our feelings hurt. And then what do we do? Oh, they did this to me. And woe is me. And people are just so mean to me. Me, 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 me right? You become selfish in the way that you think about the relationships in your life. And you don't ever think about how you're probably hurting other people's feelings. Because if everybody plays the victim, then <laughs> there's no hope for any of us. <laughs> so stop playing the victim. Focus on the future. It's essential for you to realize that when somebody commits a transgression against you, it is not the end of the relationship. Not even, especially between two Christians, you're going to see that person again in heaven. And you don't want it to have been the last interaction you had with them on earth. Been like, oh, yeah, man, um, we never got over that theological debate that we could, uh, you know, get past. Don't get locked into the past and the present. Understand that there is a future. You are eternal beings. Remember, you are eternal beings. So that means the relationships that you form with other eternal beings last for you guessed it, eternity. All right, number five, relearn to trust. Relearn to trust. You cannot have a strong relationship, okay, with anybody unless you learn how to trust them. Will they violate that trust? Yes. Are you ready? They are going to. Yes, they are going to violate that trust, all right? Are you ready? Forgiveness means relearning to trust them and allowing them to do it again, if it so be it. God loves you in a way that says, I know the worst thing you could do to me, and I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to trust you, even, even though I know you're going to do that worst thing. So if you really want to be able to love someone, you need to be able to accept that even if they did the worst thing possible to you, you would still love them. And in that environment, you have the freedom necessary to love them with the love of God. All right, moving on to six through 10. Be reasonable. Believe that you, for some cultures, that's a big deal. Be reasonable. Don't get your phone asked for forgiveness over something that might be minute, okay? So understand that you need to be reasonable in the request for forgiveness and also reasonable in the sense of um, what you're feeling transgressed about or the transgressions that you commit. Examine your heart. This is a very clear internal reflect take time to examine your heart to that anger Why? because you have to look at your motivation expect that it will take time to forgive you don't have to get over it right now there's a lot of times where i have forgiven people and i'm like look i'm i'm over it just give me a moment and it's because we want we want that relationship to be back on that high note right away, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we have to give it time to work its way back to that high note. We don't have to be so impatient in our lives. 
So be patient, be patient, forgive people, let them forgive you and understand that it might take them a little bit of time to get back to where, you know, you guys are like, what's up, you know, tight when you see them, it, it'll take a little bit of time to get there and respect that, respect the space necessary for the healing on both sides. Don't try to force things past where they are. Again, do not let your selfish desires overwhelm the other person. Okay. Sometimes we're like, well, we just, it's in the best interest of everybody. Yes, but but you can become very selfish in that desire. Practice it every day. I mentioned it earlier. If you want to learn how to love people and be really good at it, it is a daily game. It is a daily game. I would say it's a second, every second. Practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it. You're like, I suck at forgiving people. Well, only way to get better is to start. You got to start somewhere. So start picking people you can forgive easily. And eventually you'll work your way up to the ones that it's like, they've committed a wrong that you're like, I could never forgive this person for doing that. You would be surprised. It's, it's a threshold. Work your way up, work your way up and practice is how you get there. Just get better and better. Finally, ask God for guidance as you would with anything. Rely on God's strength, rely on it. If you're like, I don't have this strength, God, God's like, I got you. I'm going to bring Charlie to bring this message. He's going to give you 10 points. I am your God send. I am here to answer. No, I'm just kidding. But God will send somebody into your life or some kind of message into your life that will be the answer you're looking for. Just be aware of it. Okay. That, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my pastoral message for tonight. I hope on this Valentine's Day, you guys found that empowering, awesome, great information. Um, and if you wish to discuss further, there's my personal email for you, Freedom Church. Yes, you guys are special. So ponderingchristianity at gmail.com. Um, yeah, Mike, I am done. Good, sir.